Chapter 9. Burning Down the House Even though a critical mass of the population may be crossing the chasm and incorporating the benefits of non-ordinary states into their lives and work, that doesn't mean this revolution won't cause problems, historically. Every time ecstasy has shown up, it's led to upheaval and misuse. That's because, while the insights provided by the four forces may give us a better way to stabilize these experiences and lessen that risk, there will always be those who try to bend them to other ends. Back in the section on Pipers. Cults and commies we touched on these dangers, examining the pitfalls that non-ordinary states can pose for individuals and groups, namely, the dual issues of coercion and persuasion. Here we're going to expand that thread by focusing on two of the institutions with the most vested interest in coercion and persuasion today. The military and marketers. We'll start with militarization. Reviewing more than half a century of government attempts to weaponize consciousness. Then we'll move into commercialization where the power of ecstasy is being used to open our wallets. This latter category is a more recent development, to be sure, but one with a high potential for abuse, in both cases. We'll see how the application of non-ordinary states, as with other powerful technologies, has both ethical and political ramifications. The Atomic Donkey, it was 1953, and the Pentagon had a problem one Colonel Frank Schwebel, a U.S. Marine Corps pilot, had been shot down over North Korea, appeared on Chinese radio, and confessed that he'd been ordered to deploy biological weapons. The event was a PR nightmare. If the Pentagon let Schwebel's story stand, they'd be caught in violation of the Geneva Convention. If they discredited his account, they'd be undermining a decorated officer and prisoner of war. So the Secretary of Defense demanded, to as Annie Jacobson recounts in her recent book, the Pentagon's brain, an all-out campaign to smear the Koreans a new form of war crime and a new form of refinement in atrocity techniques, namely mind murder or menocide. If Schwebel had been the victim of communist mind murder, then his testimony could be invalidated and his patriotism upheld, a tidy solution to a messy problem. Menocide. Most in the Pentagon agreed, was a clunky word. But the CIA had been discreetly testing three a more compelling tagline in New York Times opus eds. Brainwashing. This one stuck. Brainwashing neatly encapsulated one of the deepest fears of the Cold War era. The idea that your very individuality, your own free will, could be hijacked by a totalitarian state. The CIA saw the specter of brainwashing so successfully in the minds of the American public and within its own operational culture that it came to be considered one of the primary threats of the Cold War. So even though they dreamed up this bogeyman themselves, perfecting mind control devices and drugs to combat it became a top secret, top priority. Not long after Schwebel's radio announcement, the Department of Defense got wine that a brilliant young University of Pennsylvania neuroscientist for might have discovered the very technology they'd been seeking. Representatives from nearly every government agency, the CIA, NSA, by Army, Navy, Air Force, and the State Department, all beat a path to Dr. John Lilly's door. Lilly had solved the two biggest technical problems of mechanically inducing ecstasy 5 on demand. The first was that inserting electrodes through the skull and into the brain invariably caused too much damage. The second was that pulsing unidirectional current across nerve endings tended to irreparably cook the circuitry. But Lily had developed tiny stainless steel sleeves you could tap into a subject's skull and then slip gossamer electrodes through, with virtually no swelling or lasting harm. He'd also built a machine that sent bidirectional electrical pulses through the brain that stimulated neurons without knocking them out of balance. The procedure itself was virtually painless, nothing more than pinpricks as the sleeve guides went in. The electrodes could be inserted to any depth in the brain, from the cortex down to the amygdala, and the guides could remain embedded and undetected for months or even years. In primates, Lily had discovered six that the pleasure system, what could be called the brain's basic ecstatic circuitry, correlated directly with the sexual arousal network. Male monkeys trained to use his device for self-stimulation would choose to orgasm non-stop for 16 hours, followed by eight hours of deep sleep, after which they would get right back to it. Pleasure. Lily had discovered, was an endlessly motivating and potentially all-consuming pursuit. For this reason, when the director of the National Institute of Mental Health told him to brief the Pentagon on his work, Lily expressed concern. Anybody with the proper apparatus can carry this out on a human being covertly. 7. He recounted in his autobiography, The Scientist. If this technique got into the hands of a secret agency they would have total control over a human being and be able to change his beliefs extremely quickly, leaving little evidence of what they had done. To guard against this, Lilly detailed a series of non-negotiable eight conditions under which he would be willing to discuss his findings. Nothing he said could ever be classified and everything shared would remain experimentally repeatable by him or his colleagues. 
long before Linus Torvalds gave away the source code to Linux. Or Sasha Shulgin published his chemical cookbook, or Elon Musk shared all of Tesla's car and battery patents. Long before there was even a term for it, Lilly took a stand for open sourcing ecstasy. What he hadn't counted on was how relentless the military could be. Not long after that initial presentation, Nine Lilly was contacted again, this time by an unnamed representative of the Sandia Corporation. He wanted to learn the technique of inserting the sleeve guides into the heads of large animals. Again, Lilly insisted on keeping the work declassified, but agreed to let the man come and film his latest experiments. A few years later, Harper's Magazine wrote an in-depth piece on Sandy 10 detailing their super mule project, a donkey, horse hybrid equipped with electrode implants and a solar compass. The mule carried its load, quite likely a suitcase nuke, in an exact straight line, regardless of terrain. If it veered, it was punished with pain. If it tracked, it was rewarded with pleasure. As he read the piece, Lily was shocked to recognize a photo of the man who had filmed his experiment. Sandia had managed to take mechanically induced ecstasy and harness it to wage nuclear war. Devastated. Lily realized that before he could complete his research, government agencies were going to co-opt it. He disavowed experimenting on animal or human test subjects, concluding that self-experimentation was the only ethical way to explore the boundaries of the mind. He left the NIMH and ceased all research with neurophysiological aids. Yet, despite his abandoning his position and his funding and risking his reputation and ultimately his life, Lily's work would prove endlessly fascinating to the military and intelligence communities for decades to come. He who controls the switch, in 2010. Tim Wu, a professor at Columbia Law School, discovered that information technologies, ranging from the telegraph to radio, movies, and ultimately, the internet, tend to behave in similar ways, starting out utopian and democratic and ending up centralized and hegemonic. In his book The Master Switch, Wu calls this the cycle, a recurring battle between access and control that shows up whenever these breakthroughs emerge. History shows a typical progression of information technologies. 11 he explains, from somebody hobby to somebody industry, from jury-rigged contraption to slick production marvel, from a freely accessible channel to one strictly controlled by a single corporation or cartel, from open to closed system. When radio operators began stringing up towers in the early 1920s, for example, it was so people could talk to each other and share ideas over an open broadcast medium. All these disconnected communities and houses will be united through Radio 12 as they were never united by the telegraph and telephone, wrote Scientific American. But that's not what ended up happening. By the mid-1920s, Ad and T and RCA teamed up to create the National Broadcasting Corporation, controlling access to bandwidth and creating a massive multinational company that persists to this day. By the 2000 seconds, another juggernaut, Clear Channel Communications, controlled market share and playlists in more than 30 countries. This was unification, for certain, but not of the democratizing variety imagined by the early pioneers. Because of the inevitability of the cycle, Wu believes there's no question more important than who owns the platform, the means by which people access and share information. It's what prompted him to coin the term net neutrality back in 2003 and spawn an ongoing conversation about the balance of civic and corporate power online. It's also where he got the title of his 2010 book, Before Any Question of Free Speech. 13 he writes, comes the question of who controls the master switch. While information technologies started out concrete and physical, ranchers putting up telegraph wire to connect their farms to town and radio stations building giant AM antennas, they're getting increasingly virtual. The ones and zeros of the internet and the infinite complexities of Google's search algorithms. And with the four forces, information technology is moving from the virtual to the perceptual. Ecstatic technology isn't limited to silicon chips and display screens. As John Lilly's early research established, it's the knowledge of how to tweak the knobs and levers in our brain. When we get it right, it produces those invaluable sensations of selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness. And that final step, the richness, that's the information that we can't normally access. As W.B. Yeats put it, 14 The world is full of magic things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Once information technology become perceptual, as in the case of non-ordinary states, the cycle becomes even more powerful. Our mind becomes the platform. The tug of war between access and control becomes a battle for cognitive liberty. And while nation states have consistently sought to regulate external chemicals that shape consciousness, what happens when they attempt to regulate internal neurochemistry, if that sounds far-fetched? 
Consider that elite athletes already submit biological passports to the World Anti-Doping Agency 15 to confirm their unique baselines for hormones, blood profiles, and neurochemicals. If they fluctuate from that baseline without official permission, they are penalized and even brought up on criminal charges, much in the same way that regimes used to declare certain books subversive. It's not too much of a stretch to imagine a government declaring certain brain chemistry subversive. A telltale combination of neurotransmitters coursing through your bloodstream could be enough to get put on a watch list. Or worse. So while it's tempting to herald the four forces as a development that is going to unlock ecstasy for the masses, we'd be naive to think that a persistent historical pattern, the battle for control of the master switch, won't apply this time around. Spooks to kooks. The struggle over Lily's brain stimulation device was an early example of the cycle in action of whether an ecstatic technology could remain freely accessible or would end up centrally controlled. Since then, that struggle has evolved into a decades-long game of cat and mouse between the spooks of the intelligence community and the kooks of the counterculture. Scientists like Lily repeatedly pioneered new techniques to alter consciousness just in time to have the government attempt to weaponize them, or the spooks worked on some new top-secret application, only to have it leak out and get reproposed by the kooks. And while some of the stories we'll cover in this section may sound so outlandish they stretch credulity, they consistently underscore Wu's thesis, the high-stakes game of who controls the master switch. It turns out that more than a few of those Pentagon officials who came knocking on Lily's door were funded by the CA. They were part of MKUltra, arguably the largest and most notorious brainwashing project in U.S. history. Some 80 institutions, including universities, colleges, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies, took part. Their goal was to find chemicals that could control and confuse enemy combatants, civilian, populations, and heads of state, including one spy versus spy plan to slip Fidel Castro an LSD-soaked cigar 16, within the CIA itself. We're taking LSD regularly, 17 tripping at the office, at agency parties, measuring their mental equilibrium against those of their colleagues, Jay Stevens recounts in Storming Heaven. Turn your back in the morning and some whiskey would slip a few micrograms into your coffee. It was a game played with the most exalted of weapons. The mind and sometimes embarrassing things happened. Case-hardened spooks would break down crying or go all gooey about the brotherhood of man. In addition to these frat boy antics, the program engaged in more serious lapses in judgment. They repeatedly dozed mental patients and prompted one of their own. A chemist at Fort Detrick's Biological Weapons Center, 18 to jump or get thrown out a 13-story New York City hotel window. And in the annals of unintended consequences, MKUltra gets a notable mention for accidentally unleashing a leviathan, the psychedelic revolution of the 1960s, almost exactly 2,500 years after Alcibiades' first stole Kaikin. A young student named Ken Kesey poached some too, only this time it was from the CA. Like Alcibiades, Kesey was disarmingly persuasive and controversial, wangling his way to a tuition-free spot in a graduate writing seminar at Stanford and enduring a criminal trial and exile of his own. Just as Socrates had doubted whether Alcibiades was a worthy pupil, Wallace Stegner, the literary lion who headed the writing department at Stanford, didn't think much of Kesey either. Stegner dismissed him as a sort of highly talented illiterate 19 and a threat to civilization and intellectualism and sobriety which as it turns out, wasn't far off, as background research for his novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was set in a mental institution. Kesey had been volunteering at a U.S. Veterans Administration hospital to earn a little extra money. A friend of his had turned him onto the $75 per session experiments the docs were running there on psychomimetic drugs, meaning chemicals like LSD that mimicked the mental breakdown of psychosis. The scientists didn't have the guts to do it themselves. 20 Kesey later told Stanford Alumni Magazine, so they hired students. When we came back out, they took one look at us and said, whatever they do, don't let them go back in that room, over on Perry Lane. The Bohemian Cottage Enclave where he lived, Kesey and his growing band of pranksters took things out of the lab and into the field. Volunteer Kesey gave himself over to Science 21 at the Menlo Park Vets Hospital. Tom Wolfe recounts in the electric Kool-Aid acid test, and somehow drugs were getting up and walking out of there and over to Perry Lane. Half the time. Wolfe continues, Perry Lane would be like some kind of college fraternity row 22 with everybody out on a nice autumn Saturday afternoon on the grass. Playing touch football. And our later Kesey and his circle would be hooking down something that in the entire world only they and a few other avant-garde neuropharmacological researchers even knew about. What happened next became the well-documented subject of counterculture lore. Kesey moved the experiment into the hills above Palo Alto, 
Hunter S. Thompson, the Hells Angels, and Neil Cassidy all showed up, as did a strange little band called the Grateful Dead. Led by a chinless but oddly magnetic guitarist named Jerry Garcia, armed with gallons of day glow paint, 23 strobe lights, and the prototypical art car, a tricked-out 1939 International Harvester bus named Further, Keezy and his merry pranksters birthed West Coast psychedelic culture, control of the master switch had been wrestled away from the spooks. And neither Silicon Valley nor the wider world would ever be the same. Over the next decade, Eastern mysticism, liberated sexuality, and following your bliss mounted a direct challenge to the traditional values of mainstream America. But, while the kooks were enthusiastically sharing esoteric techniques with a broader audience, the spooks never lost interest in the movement they had accidentally birthed. By the mid-1970s, Watergate had broken, Saigon had fallen, and a demoralized defense department was in serious need of inspiration. A round of post-Vietnam soul-searching. 20 for Fortune reported, culminated in the establishment of Task Force Delta, a cadre of army officers whose mission was to scan for new ideas. No one was better at scanning for those ideas than Jim Channon, a lieutenant colonel in the army and veteran of tours of duty in Vietnam. I just made it my weekend duty to get around all of these places. Like Isolin, make friends and find out what this esoteric technology really was 25. By the time he'd finished his hot tubs and crystals junket, Channon had, for all intents and purposes, gone native. He penned the 1st Earth Battalion Operations Manual. 26 making the case that deliberately cultivating non-ordinary states, including the ability to experience universal love, to perceive auras, to have out-of-body experiences, to see into the future, and, perhaps most memorably, to encounter the enemy with sparkly eyes, could transform the military. And as far out as this sounds, Channon's manifesto took on fabled status among progressive thinkers in the military, and beam me up Spock. The New Mental Battlefield, 27 a 1980 article for the State Journal, Military Review. Lieutenant Colonel John Alexander argued that a new battlefield dimension that may defy our general perceived concepts of time and space looms on the horizon. Clearly, psychotronic weapons already exist, only their capabilities are in doubt. Even the U.S. Army's famous Be All You Can Be slogan sprang from Task Force Delta's mission to unlock human potential. A couple of years later, the Pentagon commissioned the Trojan Warrior Project, an intensive six-month training in mind-body-spirit practice for Green Barretts. The program included meditating with a Tibetan Lama, neuro and biofeedback sessions in a cutting-edge computer lab, praying with a Benedictine monk, and training in Aikido, a Japanese martial art dedicated to universal peace. It was a frontal assault on the neurophysiology of ecstasy. For their coat of arms, they combined ancient and pop mythologies, a wooden horse sat above to cross lightsabers. Their motto, by Sit Tecum. May the force be with you. While this progressive era produced some undeniable white hat dividends, ranging from mindfulness and stress reduction programs for the general enlisted to martial arts training in the Marine Corps, there were also some black hat applications. In his manual, Channon had lobbied for the calming, soothing, and inspiring capacities of music, hoping that bass, not bombs, would prevail on the battlefield of the future, almost as an afterthought. He'd added that, if all else failed, 28 unpleasant, discordant sounds could be used to disorient enemy combatants. But that afterthought got noticed. In May 2003, Newsweek ran a short blurb PSYOPS, cruel and unusual, 29 revealing that U.S. military detention units were using a combination of bright light, disorienting sounds, and other consciousness-shifting tactics to break Iraqi prisoners. Trust me, it works, says one U.S. operative. In training, they forced me to listen to the Barney I Love You song for 45 minutes. I never want to go through that again. That was the sound bite that launched a thousand clips. But rather than acknowledging the military's ethically questionable interrogation tactics, the news cycle spun happily on, with TV hosts inserting a Barney as torture for us to gag right in between footage of pandas at the zoo and the local weather. What began as an attempt to infuse the military with the idealism of the human potential movement had devolved into a tool for psychological warfare. And the cycle turned on, and it's still churning today. Consider the government's clandestine role at Burning Man. On the surface, the festival, a one-week gathering on an utterly forgettable patch of U.S. Bureau of Land Management desert, is not what you'd consider a high-value target. But for the short few days of its existence, the event holds the dubious distinction of being one of the most surveilled cities in the country, despite experiencing less violent crime than most mid-sized suburbs. It draws over a dozen separate state and federal agencies equipped with millions of dollars of high-tech spy gear, infrared goggles, tactical vehicles, and undercover agents. In heavily redacted documents recently released through the Freedom of Information Act, 
30. It turns out that the FBI has conducted a multi-year intelligence program at Burning Man. The official reason was to scout for domestic terrorists and track potential threats from Islamic extremists, more likely. The FBI was taking a page out of their old COINTELPRO playbook, 31 the one used in the 1960s to infiltrate and destabilize the Black Panthers, students for a democratic society and the American Indian movement. If that were the case, then one would expect increased surveillance of the event, heightened policing, insertion of agents provocateurs, and aggressive prosecution of nonviolent crimes. And while it's hard to tell if it's an anomaly or the beginning of a trend, 32 in 2015, plainclothes and undercover agents spiked, and rests at the festival were up 600%. It seems safe to say that the intelligence community knows something big is happening out in the desert. They just can't quite figure out what. That's because, other than the obvious external cues, the fiery explosions, wild costumes, and all-night dance parties, what's really going on is happening in people's minds, to the rank-and-file law enforcement monitoring. The festival, it must seem like a roadie or Mardi Gras, or a Times Square New Year's with fewer drunks and more hugging. But not so for the top brass, in some instances. As we saw when Camp Plague on commandeered a spy satellite, and the Supreme Commander of NATO attended the event, they're in on it. And this repeated pattern of the spooks lying down with the kooks. From hippie float tanks at the SEAL's mine gym, to Kesey's misadventures at the VA hospital. To Lieutenant Colonel Chan and Hadabing at Isolin, to the Pentagon at Burning Man, clearly highlights the back-and-forth contest for control of the master switch. More critically, it illustrates one of the central challenges of ecstasy, how to ensure that powerful techniques for altering consciousness don't get used for the wrong reasons. To note that a tool is morally neutral is a standby of college philosophy papers. But in the case of ecstatic technologies, it's unsettlingly true, as we saw in earlier chapters. Fully expressed ecstasy tends to promote empathy, compassion, and well-being. But at 80% expression, what then? Even this brief survey of the past half-century shows that ecstasy can easily be bent to darker ends. The selflessness that is the hallmark of a non-ordinary state is only a hop, skip, and a jump from the brainwashing the Pentagon so desperately sought in the 1950s. Timelessness devoid of reference points, can feel a lot like paranoid schizophrenia and has been a linchpin of solitary confinement for centuries. The euphoric neurochemistry of effortlessness, as John Lilly realized, can create dependency on whoever can administer that next hit of bliss. Information richness can be mined as a truth serum. As the MK Ultra docs attempted, or amped up to overwhelm the unwilling, as the military guards orchestrated in Iraq, in the same way that it takes a far less developed society to detonate a nuclear bomb than to invent one. The power of ecstasy constantly tempts those who would have no idea how to replicate it on their own. But once they see it in action, once they can map the fundamental logic, it doesn't take much to turn it to ends that would mortify its original creators. Soma. Delicious Soma. If the prospect of the military-industrial complex hijacking ecstasy to pursue its own agenda is sobering, an equally likely outcome is that we end up seduced by our own desires. In fact, control not through coercion. As totalitarian states have done, but through persuasion is an even more likely prospect. In 2007, a collection of the world's biggest brands 33, Apple, Coca-Cola, American Express, Nike, Samsung, Sony, and Ford put up $7 million to fund a study into the neuroscience of buying behavior. They wanted to know if there were more effective ways to sell their products and joined forces to underwrite the largest neuromarketing study ever conducted, an attempt to replace misleading focus groups with straight-ahead brain scans. Marketing researcher and consultant Martin Lindstrom teamed up with British neuroscientist Gemma Calvert for the project. Over the course of three years, they used both fMRI and E to scan the brains of more than 2,000 people as they made a variety of buying decisions. The researchers discovered that product placement 34 in TV shows and movies rarely works, that warning labels of cigarettes actually prime the urge to smoke more, and that, most surprisingly, shopping and spirituality seem to rely on similar neuronal circuitry. When deeply religious subjects view sacred iconography or reflect on their notion of God, brain scans reveal hyperactivity in the caudate nucleus, a part of the pleasure system that correlates with feelings of joy, love, and serenity. But Lindstrom and Calvert found that this same brain region lights up when subjects view images associated with strong brands like Ferrari or Apple. Bottom line. Calvert reported, there was no discernible way to tell the difference between the way subjects' brains reacted to powerful brands 35 and the way they reacted to religious icons and figures. Clearly, our emotional engagement with powerful brands shares strong parallels with our feelings about religion. 
Lindstrom's high-profile advocacy of the neuromarketing revolution put him on Time's list of the 100 most influential people. But it triggered a backlash. Critics rightly pointed out that just because spiritual symbols and corporate logos activate similar brain regions, doesn't make shopping a religious experience. While Lindstrom may have exaggerated the capabilities of neuromarketing in 2007, by the next decade the idea of tweaking the knobs and levers of the brain for purely commercial ends had become much more of a reality. In 2013, for example, we were asked to keynote the annual meeting of the Advertising Research Foundation, a global consortium of just about every major brand you can think of. From Coca-Cola, Walmart, and Procter and & Gamble to creative agencies like J. Walter Thompson, Ogilvy & Mather, and Omnicom, to tech giants like Facebook, Google, and Twitter, the foundation wanted to learn about the use of flow in advertising. Could this state of consciousness play a role in prompting buying behavior? Could the mechanics of ecstasy be used to drive market share? To understand this possibility, it's helpful to understand a few of the developments that have led to today's marketplace. At the tail end of the 20th century, we started moving from the selling of ideas, 36 the so-called information economy, toward the selling of feelings, or what author Alvin Toffler called the experience economy. This is why retail shops started to look like theme parks. Why, instead of stocking ammo on their shelves like Walmart, the outdoor retailer Cabela's turns their stores into a hunter's paradise of big game mounts, fox mountainsides, and giant aquariums. It's how Starbucks can charge for dollars for a 50-cent cup 37 of coffee because they're providing that cozy third place between work and home. But we were at the Advertising Research Foundation 38 to discuss the next step. The move from an experience economy to what author Joe Pine calls the transformation economy. In this marketplace, what we're being sold is who we might become. Or as, Pine explains, in the transformation economy, the customer is the product. On the surface, the idea that we would favor products that could help us become who we want to be doesn't sound bad. Take the fitness industry. In the experience economy, one of the undisputed leaders is Equinox Gyms, which blends state-of-the-art equipment, boutique lobbies, and eucalyptus steam baths to create a luxury workout. You may or may not get as lean as those models 39 in the black and white photo spread, but you'll certainly feel like a million bucks while you're there. In the transformational economy, CrossFit charges almost as much but offers none of those perks. Instead, what you get is the promise that after three months of sweating in their stripped-down boxes as CrossFitters call their workout spaces, you'll become a radically different person. You'll look different. For certain, but because of their emphasis on embracing challenge and pushing boundaries, you'll stand a chance of acting and thinking differently as well. That's a positive transformation that many are willing to suffer and pay a premium for 40. Yet, it doesn't take much to bend this desire for personal change in more commercial directions. Consider a recent Jeep campaign. 41 where they built mud bogs at county fairs, with thumping music and flashing lights amplifying the joyride. Jeep let fairgoers hop into one of their stationary rigs, floor the motors, spin the tires, and send dirt flying. The novelty of the experience. The rapid shift in sensations, the lights, music, and cheering crowd was all more than enough to trigger the brain's pleasure machinery and get red-blooded 20-somethings fixating over no money down leasing options for weeks to come. That Jeep campaign worked so well because it effectively created a state of peak arousal for its participants and then sold them on an imagined transformation of their lives. Under those amped-up conditions, salience, that is, the attention paid to incoming stimuli, increases. But, with the prefrontal cortex down-regulated, most impulse control mechanisms go offline too. For people who aren't used to this combination, the results can be expensive. The video game industry may have gone further down this path than anyone. Games are a multi-billion dollar industry that employ the best Neurosian as 42 and behavior psychologists to make them as addicting as possible. Nicholas Cardaras, one of the country's top addiction specialists, recently explained device. The developers strap beta testing teens with galvanic skin responses, EKG and blood pressure gauges. If the game doesn't spike their blood pressure to 180 over 140, they go back and tweak the game to make it have more of an adrenaline rush effect. Video. Games raise dopamine to the same degree that sex does, and almost as much as cocaine does. So this combo of adrenaline and dopamine are a potent one to punch with regards to addiction, armed with knowledge of our deepest longings, and an understanding of exactly how to prime them, large corporations are at a distinct advantage in the influence game. In the same way that Google tailors searches based on our past histories and targeted ads follow us around the internet until we buy, we are entering an era where our cravings for transcendence can be used to co-opt our decision-making. 
Once you understand what Lindstrom calls biology, you can imprint unsuspecting consumers with all the pleasure-producing neurochemistry you can coax out of them. And as with the intelligence community's efforts, ecstasy at 100% is transformational, but ecstasy at 80% is, well, pretty much whatever you want it to be. With the advancement of the four forces, finding ways to shape decisions we're not even aware we're making has become increasingly straightforward. Less than a year after our presentation to the Advertising Research Foundation, DARPA ran an experiment demonstrating just how simple this really was. In their study, a trained storyteller told an audience 43 wired to EEG sensors and heart rate monitors a heart-wrenching tale of childhood bullying. Then she asked for donations to an organization working to end this behavior. Simply by reviewing the biometrics, DARPA scientists were able to predict with 70% accuracy who was most deeply moved by the story and who would choose to give money to the cause. Physiological data alone was enough to predict future spending. They also discovered how to prompt that impulse. For the pitch to be most effective, that is, to earn the most money, it had to be highly engaging and display significant contrast between positive and negative story elements. Since the speaker was wearing a discreet earpiece while on stage, the researchers could use biofeedback to provide instant feedback telling her to change the story on the fly. Increasing tension, deepening empathy, and constantly priming the audience to alter their behavior. While this study focused on a relatively benign example of persuasion, the very fact that DARPA was the one funding it should give us pause. Imagine newscasters or politicians wielding similar technology, able to pluck heartstrings, stoke outrage, inspire hope, and even trigger communities just by reading and tuning our neurobiology. If focus group politics leaves us with a bad taste, how will biofeedback politics go down? Kevin Kelly, futurist and the co-founder of Wired Magazine, has a few ideas. In a 2016 article on virtual reality darlings of the moment, Oculus and Magic Leap, Kelly examines VR's potential as a technology of surveillance and control. It's very easy to imagine a company that succeeds in dominating the VR Universe 40 for quickly stockpiling intimate data on not just what you and 3 billion other people favorite but a thousand other details. To do that in real life would be expensive and intrusive. To do that in VR will be invisible and cheap. Soon VR systems are going to track everything from eye gaze to vocal tone too. As DARPA-style biometrics get further integrated, neurochemistry, hormones, brainwaves, and cardiac coherence. This comprehensive tracking of your behavior inside these worlds. 45 continues Kelly could be used to sell you things, to redirect your attention, to compile a history of your interests, to persuade you subliminally, to quantify your actions for self-improvement, and so on. If a smartphone is a surveillance device we voluntarily carry in our pocket, then VR will be a total surveillance state we voluntarily enter. So imagine the kind of immersive visionary experience that Android Jones is creating. One already designed to prompt state change, then add in this kind of biofeedback loop. In exchange for the thrill of getting higher, we'll willingly give up intimate details about ourselves. It'll be the new cost of getting our minds blown. Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel. Brave New World gave us a look at exactly how this could happen. Set in the year 2054, Huxley described a hyper-commercialized world in which people were conditioned with brainwashing, sexual diversions, and soma. A psychedelic antidepressant offering all the advantages of Christianity and alcohol, none of their defects 46. In 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain. Wrote NYU professor Neil Postman in Brave New World. They are controlled by inflicting 47 pleasure, in short. Orwell feared that our fears will ruin us. Huxley feared that our desire will ruin us. And while the possibility of a nation deliberately invading our minds to shape and control behavior may feel like a relic of Cold War paranoia, the prospect of multinational corporations deliberately tweaking our subconscious desires to sell us more stuff is already here. Ecstasy wants to be free. So if these two dynamics, Commercialization and militarization are powerful enough to co-opt our deepest drives, what chance do we really have of maintaining our independence? To be sure, it's asymmetrical warfare, compared to each of us finding our way one step at a time. Governments and corporations have a much larger stake in and budget for controlling ecstasy, playing by those old rules. We don't stand a chance, in the master switch. Tim Wu acknowledges as much, describing the struggle over any information technology as an inevitable tug of war between nation states and corporations, and that either of them, left unchecked, creates imbalances. States can overreach. Companies can monopolize. Instead, Wu calls for constraining all power that derives from the control of information 48 if we believe in liberty, he writes, it must be freedom from both private and public coercion. 
It's for this reason that so many of the Prometheans we've met in this book have taken a stand for open sourcing. When the government came knocking, John Lilly demanded his ideas remain to classify. When Sasha Shulgin got that first hint of a de-crackdown, he published all his pharmacological recipes. It's there in the democratizing effects of Mickey Siegel's consciousness hacking meetups. It's why Onataste has built an orgasmic meditation app downloadable anywhere in the world. It's what fuels the volunteers of the Burning Man diaspora. Open sourcing ecstasy remains one of the best counterbalances to private and public coercion. And once we do take those freely shared ideas and use them to unlock non-ordinary states for ourselves, what do we find? A self-authenticating experience of selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness. In short, all the ingredients required for a rational mysticism. It cuts out the middlemen and remains rooted in the certainty of the lived experience. This ability to continually update and advance our own understanding ahead of anyone else's attempts to constrain or repurpose them may be the key to breaking the stalemate. Wu agrees. The cycle is powered by disruptive innovations 49 that bankrupt the dominant powers and change the world. Such innovations are exceedingly rare, but they are what make the cycle go. An open-source approach to non-ordinary states makes Wu's disruptive innovations a little less rare, and the ability to share and distribute them less susceptible to co-optation. And while the four forces don't guarantee a bloodless revolution, they do ensure that more people get to decide for themselves. And that's the ultimate paradox of these states. All that liberation comes with an unavoidable dose of responsibility. While these states provide access to heightened performance and perspective, the upsides come at a cost. Between our own wayward tendencies, and the dangers of militarization and commercialization, it's easier than ever to fall asleep at the switch.